Good morning, friends. <clears throat> Isn't this a gorgeous, nice, drippy, rainy day? <laughs> we have needed this so much. Um, if you haven't already, uh, I would remind you to turn your cell phones off or put them on airplane mode so we have more bandwidth for our friends on Zoom. <clears throat> And if you would pull up your blue hymnals, our first hymn is going to be, They'll Know We Are Christians By Our Love. It's number 119 in the Sing Joyfully book. Number 119. Any things that should be put on our calendars or uh, noted uh, for future reference. And we will start with the folks on Zoom. Are there any? I just wanted, wanted to. 
I'm sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm getting, getting an echo. I just wanted to let everyone know that I've hung a schedule up as we start collecting names for our food pledge for Family Promise. Our Family Promise Support Week begins June 25th, so it's two weeks away. Uh, we do have one uh, donation that is coming in the Wednesday before, uh, but uh, the calendar is hung. If anybody can go ahead and fill out um, what you would like to take or your donation, what you would like to give, then we'll we'll do another mashup Fairfield Friends dinner week. They look forward to our week. Thank you, Teresa. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, anyone else on um, Zoom? All right. Friends here in the meeting house, announcements? My regular announcement for nah. <laughs> for the uh, meeting for business next Sunday. Oh, and I forgot to say who I am. I'm Anita Kamek. Um, but next Sunday is our meeting for business at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Uh, I want to remind everybody, many of you signed up, or didn't sign up, put a pin in the map last week where you lived. Uh, we have a new map out in the dining room uh, because we've had lots of comings and goings since we put up the old one. So there's a new one. So all the pins are gone. If you put one in the first time and didn't put one in last week, it's not there. Uh, so go out and let us know where you live so we can find some friends that say, oh my goodness, we didn't know you lived that close. Uh, it's not a membership map, it's for people of the meeting, period. If you set foot in here, put your pen in. <laughs> I'm Sandy Beard and I brought a few guests with me today. I have my grandchildren Arden and Asher from Zionsville. I have my cousin Joanne and Jim Raper from Liberty. I have the pastor from my home church, Salem Friends, uh, Paul and Linda Ayers, and I have a cousin, Jama, and her friend, Larry. Fill the whole row. <laughs> Can you hear me? I can't. I can't. Okay, now I hear me. <laughs> I want to express that we are celebrating our 18th anniversary, Charles and I, today. And it comes with um, fear. One, because 18 years ago, we had a big white tent in our yard. I had planned this wedding in a church. And Charles was getting dressed. And he said, you know what? The next time I do this, I'm going to the Justice of the Peace. And I said, what? When, when are you planning to do this again? And so I've been on pins and needles all of these years wondering when he was going to do it again. So wish us luck. Thank you. Congrats. All right, Phil is next up with a prayer for all of us. Well, now we're coming to the part in the meeting for worship that I've been looking forward to now for nine months. <laughs> Could Miles Gully and his mother and father come forward? And if his grandmother wishes to join us, that would be nice in case he starts crying. I've been practicing all week the handoff so that he doesn't cry. Oh. 
Let's see if Joanne, okay, Joanne, try it. Let's see. Let's see. Go to Nana. There's your, there's your little person. There we go. The, the magic touch. <laughs> Miles. Miles. Can you look? There we go. Sure. Yes. I can do this. Oh, little Miles. You wonder if we let Kelsey hold I'm going to make her big Oh, Miles, since the day you were born, you made our hearts so happy. Your good humor, your fun, your ruggedly handsome looks, <laughs> and what promises to be a loving and joyful heart fills us with love and joy. We ask that your life be one of deep blessing and that you are a blessing to everyone you meet, that you always live and act with compassion, with wisdom, and with a sense of good humor so that people enjoy your company. This is our prayer for your life. Amen. Amen. Let me, let me show him off. Come on, buddy. Come on. We're not going to cry. We're not going to cry. We're just going to see people. Yes, we are. Look, you saw that guy the other day, didn't you? It was startling, wasn't it? Yes, it was. <laughs> there. You pick that up and smile. There we go. That's a boy. That's a boy. Yeah. Yeah, we'll take him over here. There's your little cousin. Yeah. Here's, these are some nice people over here. Yes. Yes. Keep an eye on that guy. He's going to wear a tux sometime. And <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, all right. Thank you for not crying. <laughs> there you go. There you go, Samuel. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Mark, you want to come up and say a prayer for our world and for us? Let us pray. Oh God, we are so grateful for rain. And as it comes down and refreshes the earth, we are grateful and reminded of how you pour your love into our lives and refresh us every day. From little babies that have more hair than their grandpa, To the concerns we have for people's dignity and pride, to the concerns we have for this world that seems to be so blind to your love and your care for each one of us, for the concerns we have for the people we love, all of which binds us together as humans humans who are kin to each other. So for all the children who cry out, Mommy, I'm hungry. And for all the children who cry out, Daddy, I'm scared. And for all who are displaced, we pray your goodness, your protection, and that you would stir people up to make that change. Amen. Would our food gatherers um, come and get the baskets and carry them around to collect food? Thank you.
important part of Quaker community uh, and faith is sharing our blessings with others. Please give generously through your weekly, monthly, or annual gifts. And I'm going to share a quote from Acts of the Apostles. In everything I showed you, that by working hard, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Since we had that lovely love blessing and invitation for our newest member, uh, I thought I would make some comments um, about uh, blessing and welcoming someone into the faith community. Because um, Miles is a blessing to us, as Phil noted. <clears throat> so are his uh, parents and extended family, and so are all of us. Um, Quakers don't do baptism. So what is this? Is that just a disguised baptism? <laughs> Not really. Um, uh, I could say yes and no to that, but I thought the occasion invites us to consider some of the similarities and differences, and so I'm just going to make a few more remarks of that. <laughs> Baptism in churches with sacramental traditions um, is usually carried on in a ritual, um, often rich with symbolism, and some of the very common symbolisms symbols are water, a candle, oils, and a white garment. The unfortunate thing is that baptism has been used to focus on, quote, original sin. Um, a pretty errant doctrine, if you ask me, even if you don't ask me. <laughs> um, Matthew Fox was more on target when he uh, considered that uh, this entry into the world and into a faith community is original blessing. Life is original blessing, and it, I, I don't think we come so tainted as many of us have been taught. But the symbol of, of water has been used to indicate being washed clean of sin, original and otherwise. Um, but it does not have to be seen that way. Think of the richness of water as a symbol of life. Um, we are born uh, from water. We live, we can't live without water. It nourishes and replenishes us constantly. It is blessing all the time. A candle is used for as a symbol of the light of Christ. Um, Christ is light of the world. That symbol's not so hard to accept, is it? Um, <clears throat> when you light a candle, it becomes a symbol of the genesis of life, uh, of fire, of spirit, um, light that is shared and warmth that is shared. Oils are a symbol of healing because so often in so many uh, early cultures, they were a major medium uh, of healing. Um, and so they are used uh, as a symbol of uniting the body and soul. Um, may take them as a, a symbol of part of the life force that we share which is one of healing and caring for one another. The white garment has, has uh, been too often, I'm afraid, uh, been representative of a clean slate. Now, now you've been washed clean, you can really start living. <laughs> Anything that happened before this doesn't count. I don't think so. <laughs> um, 
it is not a ritual that makes us a member of the family of God. We're born into it. We're born of love. We're born to love. Um, it's a healthier symbol to think of that white garment as putting on the Lord Christ, um, becoming manifestations of God. Um, and in the, in many churches, the the ritual is conducted by a priest or a minister. Now, Phil just did a, a, a wonderful role with that of speaking blessing um, and welcoming this little one. Uh, it's witnessed traditionally uh, by godparents, and that role gets defined differently in different places, but essentially uh, the godparent's role is to assume some responsibility that this child gets raised in the faith. Um, I think we can abandon the washed of original sin meaning with its emphasis on being saved from hell um, and focus instead on this is a community act. We as a community are the ones who give and receive blessing and welcome a new member. Um, it's our words and our gestures and our acts that are meant to express shared meaning and commitment. Uh, blessing is a way of life. It's a wonderful way of life. Puts us into gratitude. Um, makes us mindful of all that we draw on and depend on and uh, the bounty that we are heaped with. Um, a way of blessing is a way of healthy spirituality. Much better than backing out of hell. <laughs> um, so today we're doing another welcome for our, another member of our faith community, another human being. Um, born in the spirit and sharing spirit with us. Community is a reciprocal relationship of giving and receiving. Um, when the community receives a new member, a new person to share spirit with, it enters into a relationship of looking and listening and sharing. Um, Community gives a faith per perspective not to indoctrinate, but to teach to explore faith with hope and openness of growing in faith and love together. We create community by connecting with one another, by how we interact with one another, and we create the experience of what it means to be part of a whole and belong to something bigger than ourselves. Our sharing goes throughout our lifetimes. And look at us. There are lifetimes of all different ages overlapping, generation after generation, in an ongoing cycle of spiritual growth. What a mystery. It's a wondrous spiral of evolution we're in it together with the rich variety of our, the many experiences of all our diverse lifetimes overlapping. We're in it in exploration. We're in it together in attention to needs and in caring service for the good of each other, both individually and collectively. So let's give thanks for our blessings and get ready to give them and share them right and left. After my mother and father passed away, my brother David gathered all the family pictures from their house and uh, in various boxes that they'd been storing the pictures in 
all the years of their married life. And uh, so he gathered up all these pictures and divvied them up into five separate piles based on the sibling featured in the photograph. Um, my sister uh, received the biggest stack of pictures, being the first child, and my brother David, being the last child, received the smallest pile, two pictures taken when he accidentally stepped into a picture being taken of my sister. I fared a little better, uh, being the fourth of five children, and one of the pictures I received in my stack was a picture of my baptism taken by my grandpa Hank, who had driven north from Vincennes with my grandma Norma to witness my baptism into the Roman Catholic Church. I was frowning in the picture, obviously annoyed that a total stranger had just poured a pitcher of water on my head. It took 17 years, but I eventually got even by leaving the Catholic Church and joining the one denomination, the Religious Society of Friends, that didn't drench its members. I now realize, of course, that their intentions were good. The Catholics were worried that if I died unbaptized, I would go to limbo, specifically limbus infantum, which is the abode of those who died without actual sin, but whose original sin has not been washed away by baptism. It gets very complicated. Traditionally, this children's limbo included not only dead, unbaptized infants, but also the mentally impaired. And while it's easy to dismiss such beliefs as antiquated and even absurd, what we mustn't dismiss is a parent's impulse, however misguided, to save their children. What parent, if they honestly believed their unbaptized child risked eternal torment, wouldn't hasten to have their child baptized the moment it was born. Let's not blame the parent. If there is blame to attach, let's attach it to the theologians, namely St. Augustine, who devised such nonsense in the first place. And let's blame the clerics who kept it alive. Let's not fault the parents who simply wanted to safeguard their children. It is, in my view, indefensible that for centuries, church leaders have created dreadful and senseless doctrines, then prohibited others from questioning them. I second the words of Emile Zola, who said, civilization will arrive in full when the very last brick from the very last church falls on the very last priest. When we friends celebrate the birth of a child, we are saying three things. First, we are saying thank you. Second, we are saying this child is loved. The third thing we're saying is we are here to help. First, we say thank you. And let me let you in on a little secret. It isn't important who we think. Only that our orientation to life be one of gratitude. Some people in this life haven't yet experienced God in a way that they understand and comprehend. And I would say to them, be thankful anyway. The object of our gratitude isn't nearly as important as the fact of our gratitude. God isn't sitting up in heaven demanding our effusive praise or else. God isn't an egomaniac needing or requiring credit for every good thing that happens. 
So whether we thank God or the process of evolution or biological phenomena is beside the point. What's important is a posture of gratefulness as we move through life. Our sincere and heartfelt appreciation for the blessings in our lives. The Quaker Hannah Whittall Smith said, the soul that gives thanks can find comfort in everything. The soul that complains can find comfort in nothing. We do not want to become the kind of people who go through life forever ungrateful. We do not want to live as ungrateful, churlish people, unwilling to acknowledge our blessings. The soul that gives thanks can find comfort in anything and everything. The soul that complains can find comfort in nothing. When we celebrate a child, we are saying first and foremost, thank you. We are embracing a posture of gratitude. That's number one. Number two, we are saying this child is loved. This child is important. It is one of the saddest facts of life that far too many children in our world never sense that, are never told that, are never cherished, nor esteemed. It is a sad fact that some parents are simply incapable of love. They have satisfied the biological aspect of parenthood. They have created a human life, but they lack the capacity, ability, or inclination to love. Of all the human tragedies, the inability to love is the most scarring for both the ones who cannot love and the one who is not loved. Last week, if you were here, you'll remember that we gave our graduating males a copy of the book Hatchet by Gary Paulson. Gary Paulson was born to an absentee father and a mother incapable of love, sent to live with an aunt and uncle in the north woods of Minnesota. His life was saved by their tender compassion. To love a child bereft of love is the finest gesture of grace in which we can participate. When we celebrate a child at Fairfield, we are reminding ourselves again of the power and importance of love. Number three, to celebrate a child is to acknowledge our simultaneous commitment to nurture and provide for that child. We do not affirm the importance of a child on Sunday, then on Monday turn our backs on that child, casting that child into the utter darkness of hunger and neglect. To dedicate a child is to dedicate ourselves to the betterment of not just that child, but the betterment of all children. Dedicating ourselves to children carries with it a real and consequential commitment. We hereafter dedicate ourselves to the improvement of the world that child will inhabit. Joanne and I deliver food every Tuesday night to families at risk of hunger here in Plainfield. And several months ago, we got a phone call asking if we could take on another family to feed. And uh, this is a family with two boys in it, uh, just on the cusp of being teenagers. And those two boys are just uh, some of the finest young people I've ever met. They are unfailingly polite, and they stand watching for our car every Tuesday night at 6.30 when we pull up into their driveway. And they hurry from the door to help carry in the food so we won't have to. And Joanne has adopted those boys. I could see it in her face the first time we saw them, that we were going to have two more sons here. 
And when we pick up the food, the custom is, is that you pull up your car and the volunteers carry out a pre-selected uh, box and sacks of food that you can take. Uh, and uh, that is not working for this because now Joanne has started when we pull up the car to jumping out of the car and going back into the food pantry and loading up box after box of vegetables and fruits and meat and woe to anyone who tries to stop her. And while she's rounding up all this healthy food, I sneak over to the dessert shelf and snag them a box of Hostess cupcakes because as we all know, life is meaningless without Hostess cupcakes. But it's Joanne who has been taking their well-being to heart, has made their well-being her personal priority in life. She knows what we all must come to know, that we cannot bless one child without simultaneously committing ourselves to blessing every child. When we take a picture, we must do all we can to make sure every child is in it and not just our own. If you would pick up your blue hymnals again. Uh, let's sing number 458, Give to the Wind Your Fears. Number 458. <laughs>
car. And the first thing he did for that new car was to jack up the back end and put big tires on it. And then the second thing he did was to buy the loudest muffler that God ever made. And this young man races up and down our street, revving that engine at all hours of the day. Two o'clock in the morning, it doesn't matter. He wants us to hear his loud car. And I've been saying horrible things about that young man underneath my breath. And I have contemplated many times calling the police on him or taking a stereo over to his parents' house and putting the speakers in the window and turning it up as loud as I can. And yesterday when he came by, I was out in the hammock. I was taking a nap. It was very peaceful. And along he came and woke me up. And I had, in that moment, an epiphany that while it is easy for me to love a little child, it is sometimes very hard for me to love a child grown. And so now I have determined that whenever someone annoys me, I am going to remember that they once were a child, that they once were a child with their fears, with their anxieties, with their needs that were left unmet. And I am going to treat that adult as someone who is still being formed, someone who still needs love and compassion and friendship. So friends, don't forget to love our kids, but while you're at it, love their parents and grandparents too. <laughs> Amen. Turn and greet friends. Thank you.